so I wanted to talk to you today about the case of Linda Doloff. This case comes to us from Cumberland County, Maine, um, and this is a case that reeks of uh, reasonable doubt. One thing about our criminal justice system is that um, it's supposed to be set up so that the guilty people, or the innocent people rather, never go to prison. Um, and one of the consequences of that is that sometimes the guilty people go free. Now, I'm not saying one way or the other whether Linda, Linda Doloff um, is guilty or innocent. Um, the case is very fascinating, though, and I think that this is a case where the prosecutor went um, too far in trying to get a conviction. The prosecutor did not care about justice in this case. The prosecutor did not care whether the truth came out. All she wanted was to convict this woman, even though the case reeked high heavens of reasonable doubt. Let's start by going over the details of the case. Now, dressed in jail orange and limping from a gunshot wound to the hip, Linda Dola is the Standish woman who was accused, tried, and convicted of attempted murder. Now, prosecutors say she attacked her husband brutally with a baseball bat, uh, and then shot herself in the hip there to make it look like a home invasion. The district attorney offered me three years in prison if I would plead guilty. But I cannot do that. As I did not try to kill my husband. I now stand here in total despair. I'm 49 years old. I have lost everything. And I asked the court for leniency and mercy. Well, one Linda is a is a peace loving, kind, gentle person, content with her life, who loves the outdoors and growing flowers and I mean pottery and yoga. And the other person is a narcissistic psychopath who tried to kill her husband. One of the things that I remember when I first heard about this case is that a Sergeant Easterbrook, who happened to be close by when the 911 came, call, call came in, um, drove up the driveway and saw a shadowy figure in one of the windows of the house um, that he didn't believe was Linda. And um, Linda actually opened the front door as he um, pulled up and kind of fell out of the house. She had just suffered, suffered a gunshot wound. Um, but before I get into all the reasons why there, this case reeks of reasonable doubt, let's go through the details of the case itself. The town of Standish, Maine is a quiet corner of America. The Doloff family has called it home for generations. A street is named after the clan, bordering a piece of land that has been in the family for more than 100 years. It's a close-knit town, Sheriff Mark Doyon, uh, Dion, Doyon, Dion says, Everybody's connected to one, in one way or, or another. Unfortunately, bad things do occur from time to time. On an April night last year at the Doloff family home, one of those bad things was underway. A call came into the emergency dispatch. Quote, my husband's not responding. He shot me. He shot me. End quote. A yoga, a yoga instructor cried in a frantic recording of the 911 call. Somebody shot me. Your husband did, the dispatcher asked. No, not my husband, he's in bed, the woman replied. He's not answering me, I just hear this gurgling noise. Jeff and Linda Doloff had been married for 11 years. He was a high-powered management consultant. She was a yoga instructor. They had built a life together. His family's been in this area for six generations, Linda Doloff, 48, said. And shortly after we met, he said, you know, I've been waiting my whole life for someone to love this place as much as I do, and I still love it. Not long after the Doloffs married in 1998, they started on their life project, the Dream House on Doloff Road. We harvested the trees, <clears throat> we sawed the lumber, we planed them, uh, planed them into boards, we stood up the walls, we installed our own flooring, Linda Doloff said. It's a spectacular home with a beautiful fireplace. It's like being on vacation every day. For her, the centerpiece of the home was her yoga studio. It defined her. It was her hobby and livelihood. She taught a handful of students, 
the body stretching and mind calming effects of yoga. I'm a yoga instructor and it's not just a physical activity for me or to me or it's not just that I'm a teacher she said it's my way of life but after a dozen years of an idyllic life their marriage began to crumble she was having trouble with his three daughters from a previous marriage he complained that she was never happy anymore and he wanted out but Linda Doloff was holding back she was worried about losing her house despite a generous settlement offer to which her husband agreed. She said she had not given up on the marriage. The door was not completely shut, she said. We were moving forward. We negotiated the, the divorce up to the point where I actually felt very comfortable. Indeed, even after agreeing on terms of the divorce, they remained in the same house they loved so much. Things were so amicable they sometimes ended up in the same bed. I loved him, and if we wanted to get into the hot tub and have wine, that's what we were going to do, she said. And that, Linda told 2020, is exactly what happened on April 11, 2009, the night of the attack, a night shared by two people on the verge of divorce. There was a hot tub, a bottle of wine, sex, and then a return to their separate bedrooms for sleep. I had heard some nondescript noises, nothing that seemed alarming to me, she said. I walked down the hall. I remembered I had my head down and heard a loud bang, experienced some pain, and then fell. She said the pain was sharp, and from the bang she figured out she had been shot in the midsection, but the dark room made it impossible to see who fired the shot as she crumpled to the floor. I saw a movement, and that's all, she said. When I opened my eyes, in front of me, there was a gun on the floor. I reached for the gun, made contact with it. It fired. It scared me. Certainly my husband would be here, and I called out to him, got no response. I heard him gurgling. Surprisingly, help was not that far away. Sheriff's Deputy Sergeant Jim Eastbrook was in the area at the time of the attack. There's apparently, there had apparently had been a shooting, a home invasion of some sort, Eastbrook recalled. So I immediately start responding and started down the driveway. We don't know what's there, who's there, where they are, or where they're going, or what their motivations are. Eastbrook had his gun drawn and eyes on the house when he saw something. Right in the windows at the door, there was movement. It's a flash. It's a person. It's what I say it is, he said. I see somebody, or I see one person in the window. Eastbrook asked the 911 operator to have Linda Doloff reveal herself. And when the door opened, he said, she came outside by virtue of just kind of falling out the front door onto the front steps. Eastbrook made his way up the staircase, not knowing what he was walking into. I stepped into the house, quickly clearing the room to the left to make sure there were no people in there, Eastbrook said, and I immediately started up the stairwell. The first thing I noticed on the second step, there's a shell casing. So now I know there's been a gun introduced in this house somehow, somewhere. Halfway up the stairs, there's another shell casing. As I break the plane of the second floor, there's a handgun laying right at the top of the stairs, and I'm looking right down the barrel of it no one behind the handgun, so this is good. Eastbrook was prepared for just about anything except perhaps what he saw next. In the open door in the bedroom, a body in the bed, he recalled, and it ends up being Jeff Dulloff. He's lying with his head at the foot of the bed. He's naked. He's covered with blood. He was just an absolute mess. If we didn't get, the, get help to this guy, he was going to die. Police searched the house without finding an intruder. A police dog was called in, but it did not pick up any tracks. The Doloffs were taken to the hospital. Linda Doloff's wound required surgery to repair torn flesh and a blood vessel. She had a bullet fragments lodged in her hip. But Jeff Doloff appeared to have been attacked with a baseball bat. His wounds were much more serious. He was admitted to the hospital in critical condition with fractures on both sides of his head, a broken nose, both cheekbones broken and more chipped bones inside his skull. I had doubts if he would make it, Fire Chief Brent Libby said. His injuries were life-threatening. Since Linda Doloff said she saw neither the attack on Jeff nor who had shot her, police were hoping Jeff Doloff would be their star witness, but he was unconscious in a medically induced coma for weeks. Now Jeff Doloff said 
They said they had never seen anyone survive injuries like this. I had a nose bone shoved into my brain. What I am left with today is someone else's teeth in the front and no teeth in the back, he said. I can't smell, I can't taste. Apparently there is no hope for that. The side of my face, I have feeling, but it's almost like it's in Novocaine. My eyes water all the time. The guys that worked for me, God bless them, they put Humpty Dumpty back together again. For police, there was another big problem. Whoever tried to beat Dolov's brains in had succeeded in killing his memory. He said he remembers absolutely nothing from the night of the attack. And when asked who could have done this, Dolov told Maine State Police Detective Bill Ross that he had lots of en enemies. His job as a corporate consultant involves downsizing, deciding who gets big dollar contracts and who does not, sometimes costing people their jobs. Who would want to hurt me? Dolov told the grand jury, I can give you a list of a thousand people. But police weren't buying a retaliation attack or burglary gone bad, the house looked too occupied to encourage a home invasion. I think with any job, you're going to piss people off. You're going to, people are going to be aggravated with decisions that you make, Ross said. But at what point does that rise to? I'm going to come to your home on a holiday weekend with five cars in the driveway and commit this crime. Police interviewed his co-workers without generating a lead, and then Ross turned his attention inside the house. He began asking questions about their impending divorce, which was yet to be finalized. I want to know about your relationship with Linda, Ross asked Dolov. Did she want a divorce? I don't think so, he replied, sitting with Dolov in his hospital room. Ross had an idea. I've got my phone right here. I've got my recorder. Let's call Linda right now, Ross said. Are you willing to do this? Ross wanted to get her talking. He had begun to suspect that she had a hand in the crime. He hoped that hearing her husband's voice for the first time since the attack would lure her into making a mistake. He asked me if I had a problem calling Linda, and what he was looking for was a story, Dolov said. Dolov placed the call. His wife had no idea she was being recorded or that the police were beginning to look her way. I'm hearing rumors that somebody took a baseball bat to me and shot you, Dolov said to his wife on the phone. Is that right? I was shot, she replied. I don't know what happened to you. Specifically, I don't know. She told him what she said she remembered. We got in the hot tub. We had some wine, she said. Oh, we made love. After a while, you started snoring. I couldn't sleep. I went back to the other bedroom. Linda Dolov said she was heading to the bet the bathroom when I heard a loud bang and I fell. The way my injuries look, it looked like someone took a baseball bat to me. Not a gun, Jeff said. Took out both eye sockets, took out my nose, took out my throat, took out my head on both sides. Oh my God, she said. Why would they beat me with a baseball bat and shoot you with a gun? They were sitting on on $1,500 cash they left in the drawer. I have no freaking idea, she said. Then for the first time, Jeff Dolov said it out loud. He told his wife a, of a dozen years that he was beginning to think she had something to do with this beating. You should have heard somebody 10 feet away from you, Dolov said. You should have seen somebody 10 feet from you. A lot of this um, doesn't make sense to me. This is going to cost me the rest of my life. Are you saying you think I had something to do with this, she replied? Well, there's only one person in the world who's pissed off at me right now, and that's you, he said. There was nothing in the conversation that she'd like to take back now, Linda Dolov told ABC News. Absolutely not. Perhaps he needed to call to allay any of his fears that I, you know, I was responsible for it in any way, Linda said. That was a way for him to be able to talk to me and hear my own voice, to hear my own voice saying that it wasn't me. She admitted nothing. Still, within a month, even without a confession or direct evidence against her, police made the main yoga instructor the central suspect in the brutal attempted murder on her husband. Police had a changing sense of her possible motive for the attack. She had always claimed the pending divorce was amicable, 
and that her husband was generous and open to reconciliation. But police had found out from Jeff Doloff something she had not told them. Just before the attack, he had announced that he was bringing a woman to the house Linda loved for a look-see. I had told her there was a woman in Massachusetts I met when I was working down there, and I would like her to come up and see the farm, he said, to meet the dog, to meet the kids, to meet my mother, and to meet the neighbors. She admitted it was hard to hear when I had plenty of time to get accustomed to what was going on and he was starting and he was started talking in February and I was hurt of course she said Ross brought Linda Doloff in for an interrogation he told her that her story of an outside intruder did not make sense it's difficult for us to see how Jeff was assaulted by someone else that came in from outside of the house Ross told Linda in a tape of the interrogation what else happened that night I don't know how to answer that question, she said. We had a nice dinner together. Ross grew direct at one point. I think Jeff wanted to move on with his life, Ross told her on the tape. I think Jeff was looking to push you off to the side. I didn't feel that way, she said. He was taking care of me. Linda didn't budge. She said she wasn't feeling well, stood up and ended the interview. Until I sat in the room, I guess I just... I didn't want to believe it, she said, and I didn't want to accept the fact that somebody would think I was capable of doing such an act. Two weeks later, Linda Doloff was handcuffed, put in the back of a squad car, and charged with attempted murder, elevated aggravated assault, and filing a false report. She would plead not guilty to all charges. ABC News asked her directly whether she tried to kill her husband. Absolutely not, she said. Never thought about it. No, never. No, absolutely not. This whole thing about yoga and peace and the tranquility, there are two Lindas, said Stephanie Anderson, the Cumberland County District Attorney in charge of prosecuting the case. There's this facade of Linda that is very, you know, a naturopathic and med um, meditative and, and all of that. But there's also Linda on the inside that is very, very different. Do I think she's a murderer? Question? I mean, generally, no. I don't think she is a murderer generally. I think she tried to kill her husband. Doloff, who still limps from a bullet to her hip, hired defense attorney Dan Lilly, a veteran of more than 50 homicide cases to defend her. He said Linda was offered a plea bargain. The prosecutor prior to the trial offered a three-year term in jail and two years probation, Lilly said. She turned that down because she said she didn't commit the crime and she wanted a trial. It was a huge gamble. Linda Doloff was facing up to 30 years prison sentence if convicted. This was going to be the Super Bowl from our point of view, Sheriff Dion said. I mean, the best on both sides had gathered within this case to wrestle it out in the courtroom. Guilty on all three counts. That decision this afternoon from jurors in the Linda Doloff trial. She is the Standish woman accused of trying to kill her husband last year and then cover it up. And you saw the verdict first here on News 8. This afternoon, a jury convicted Doloff of attempted murder, elevated aggravated assault, and filing a false report. News 8's Jackie Kuchar is live with details from the Cumberland County Court. Jackie? Well, Tracy, Linda Doloff expected to leave here a free woman. Instead, she was led away in handcuffs. The defense says they are stunned by the verdict. The prosecution, however, thrilled over the outcome. You can see Linda Doloff's jaw drop as she hears that she's been convicted of beating her husband nearly to death with a baseball bat, then shooting herself in the stomach to cover it up. Her attorney, Dan Lilly, requested a mistrial, citing the prosecutor let in her personal beliefs on the case during closing arguments while the judge denied that. Per the prosecution's request, Doloff's bail was revoked, so she was taken into custody. Outside of court, she made no comment to the media and showed no expression. District Attorney Stephanie Anderson, who prosecuted the case, says though most of the evidence was circumstantial, she was confident jurors would convict Olive. 
but it's necessarily gaps because you don't have an eyewitness to fill those in for you. So the jury has to do that. And so there's always a concern, but um, I think the jury did a really good job. It was clear uh, when they went out yesterday and they immediately asked to see evidence that they were getting right into sorting through that evidence and taking their job very seriously. I'm a great believer in the jury system, and I'm taken back a little bit. There are many unanswered questions, unfortunately. It seems like I think the jury expected us to answer rather than the state, and I think that's a problem. I'm not criticizing the jury system because I'm all for it, but boy, this one this sets me on my heels. Here is the mugshot taken of Linda Dolov as she was taken to the Cumberland County Jail tonight. Her trial lasted about two weeks, but after hearing all of the testimony, it took jurors about seven hours of deliberations over two days to reach their decision. News 8's Jackie Kutcher was in the court for the verdict, and she joins us now with the latest on Linda Dolov's future. Jackie? Well, Tracy, Linda Dolloff's defense team says the evidence doesn't support the conviction, so they are filing a motion for acquittal. Dolloff came to court today fully expecting to walk away a free woman. Instead, she was led away in handcuffs. Her jaw dropped when she heard the verdict. Linda Dolloff was convicted of all three charges, attempted murder, elevated aggravated assault, and filing a false report. One of the strongest pieces of evidence was the um, sheer ridiculousness of the intruder uh, story. Prosecutors say Dolliff nearly beat her husband to death with a baseball bat, then shot herself in the stomach to make it look like a home invasion. Dolliff says it was an intruder who carried out the attack. Jurors didn't believe her story. I'm stunned. I'm stunned. I. Uh... I, I never expected that. Prosecutors say they're relieved. This is a murder case. It's a murder case where the victim miraculously survived. Jeffrey Doloff still suffers from side effects from the beating. District Attorney Stephanie Anderson says he is also relieved with the verdict and relieved his wife, who is about to divorce, is once again in custody. Her bail revoked after the verdict. Word stunned is the only thing I can say, I think. She fully intended that acquittal would, would, would occur, and she for, for, uh, fully expected it to occur. Linda had really good reason to believe that the jury was going to find her innocent because there was so much reasonable doubt in this case. I mean, again, I'm not saying that she was guilty or she was innocent, but I am saying that this case reeked to high heavens of reasonable doubt from the police officer responding, um, Sergeant Estabrook, who saw immediately upon arriving a shadowy figure in the window that he didn't believe was Linda and then of course um, some more reasonable doubt that, that popped up was there was no gun residue on her hands her DNA was not on the gun uh, there was no gunshot residue on her shirt either these are big things let's listen to this video um, I think it was done by 2020 where Linda's explaining this with the forensics that are there is it possible that you shot yourself, do you believe? There would be blood in the barrel. There would be, I think, something called tattooing around the wound. There would be um, the burn marks on my shirt. There is no evidence of any of those, and my DNA is not on the trigger, and I have no idea how I could shoot myself if I did not. Both the gun and the shirt that Linda was wearing that night was sent to the Maine State Police Crime Lab and they tested it thoroughly and the report that came back did not help the prosecution in one bit. I think Kimberly Stevens tested it. Look to see if there's gunpowder on the shirt. If the gunshot wound was self-inflicted, then we're looking at a shot that would need to be fairly close range because someone's arm is only so far. Stevens test fired the actual gun that shot the bullet into Linda's hip and you can see the bright muzzle flash which you would think would burn gunpowder into Linda's shirt if it was fired at close range. But surprisingly enough, Linda was right. The gunpowder the state expected to find was not there. I looked at it visually under the stereo microscope and there was no powder residue on the shirt. And even though you get a muzzle flash, there was no singeing or burning of the material on that shirt. But the state was not happy with that result, so they did a test that's seldomly used where you look for lead vapors on the shirt, and there was trace amounts of lead vapors found, and they claimed that that was enough to prove that she shot herself. But it really is not. 
there's no lead vapor experts out there that would ever say that the trace amounts of lead vapor found on her shirt was enough to prove that she shot herself. So again, huge reasonable doubt. Next, they wanted to prove that Linda had blood on her that was Jeff's from the shirt she was wearing. But even though the room was coated from blood from ceiling to floor, there was only a small amount of blood that was on her shirt. She's got blood here on her left cuff, a little streak, and she's got spatter under her right armpit. So that is pretty damaging. I think it's consistent with a baseball stance and whacking somebody with it. But according to the state's own blood splatter expert, that was not accurate. Is that accurate? I'm not sure that it's accurate to say that there was no other explanation for it. What's interesting is the report that was read to the jury says that no conclusion can be drawn from Linda Dolloff's clothing. It's possible that she got the blood on her when she was comforting or when she was just walking through or falling down in the crime scene. But determined to win, the prosecutor lied to the jury. How could she get those stains but for the fact that she was whacking them with this baseball bat? There's no other explanation for that. When she says there is no other explanation, that's not true. Um, I guess I would have to look at the statement, right? I don't think that that would be accurate. There's so much reasonable doubt in this case. We have the shadowy figure in the window. We have no gunshot residue on her shirt or her hands. Her DNA is not on any of the weapons. Um, the blood on her shirt is just not enough to just to, to be consistent with the bloody mess that was in the room from blood splatter on the floor to the ceiling inside that bedroom. We have a really weak motivation for the case um, since uh, she was having a peaceful and amicable bold divorce from her husband. They were living in the same house. They just had sex earlier that day. Just so much reasonable doubt is cast in this case, but the prosecutor ignored it all and just blatantly lied to the jury even though their own witnesses said that there was an explanation for the blood on the shirt. Uh, the evidence in this case, the physical evidence in this case, does not point directly at anybody and in fact the blood evidence that you saw in this case uh, says that in fact Linda Doloff uh, cannot be, it cannot be concluded that Linda Doloff did this uh, from the blood on her clothing. Uh, there's no DNA on the trigger of the gun which supposedly she used to shoot herself that matches her. In fact, there's DNA on that gun uh, in the trigger from somebody else, an unknown person. Uh, so yes, she does have some compelling points uh, when we talk to her. She also points out that her entire life has been one of nurturing and of peace and calm. Uh, this is not, the, Linda Dolloff is not the kind of person you would expect would murder her husband, even if she was upset at him, she says, and she says she wasn't upset at him. That the facts are, she says, that they had sex that night, that they had dinner together, they had glasses of wine in the hot tub. There was no reason for her to be upset, although they were getting divorced. She says it was amicable, and she's very convincing on that. So, of course, there's, a, there's another side to this story, and I think this 2020 reporter summarizes the prosecution's arguments um, very effectively. Her story uh, about an intruder coming in finding, bringing not their own weapon in, but bring finding a weapon, two weapons inside that house, that's not what an intruder does. If an intruder's coming in to murder somebody or to try to murder somebody, they bring their own weapon, if that's the point in coming. If they're, if they're a burglar, frequently they don't mess with anybody. As soon as they see somebody who wakes up, they run. Uh, they wouldn't start beating on somebody in their bed. So her story of an intruder doesn't hold up. So there's evidence on both sides, and that to answer your first question, that's what makes this such an interesting case. So obviously that story does not make a whole lot of sense, but is it, defen is it the defense's job to make that story make sense? Or is it just the defense's job to poke holes in that story? And I think that the defense did a very effective job in poking holes in that story. The fact that there was a shadowy figure that was seen in the window by the responding officer. The fact that somebody else's DNA was mysteriously found on the gun. These are huge holes that actually give credibility to her story and cast tons of reasonable doubt. 
The jury, as you saw, was very open about the fact that uh, in the beginning uh, they had a lot of sympathy for Linda Doloff. In fact, there were five not guilty verdicts, uh, votes in the first uh, vote. Uh, all the women on the jury voted not guilty uh, at the beginning. Uh, they believed that there was still a chance that somehow an intruder had gotten in it, the police did not do a good enough job uh, in surrounding the uh, house and looking around the house to rule out an intruder. So they had some doubt about that. Uh, but in the end, I think what you saw there was Linda Doloff's, only, Linda Doloff's own words really sunk her, the words that were on her computer. The last evidence in the case was a document called the, the Corinthians document. And in that document, Linda Doloff says that she's frightened, that she feels alone, that she feels desperate. And the jury had been hearing all along, and as we had from our interviews, that Linda Doloff said she wasn't any of those. So they're saying that um, the jury... The last bit of evidence was the was Linda Doloff's personal journal, where she writes down some of her vulnerability her vulnerabilities, and that was what sunk her in the end. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. There was something else going on in that jury room. I just don't get it. There was just so much reasonable doubt in this case. It doesn't make sense. Standish woman convicted of attempted murder for beating her husband with a baseball bat has appealed her conviction to Maine's highest court. Linda Doloff is serving a 16-year sentence for the attack, which she claimed happened during a home invasion. News 8 Steve Minnick was in court today, and he joins us live from the newsroom with the latest. Steve? Well, Tracy, Linda Doloff herself was not inside the courtroom today. Convicted back in 2010, among other issues, her lawyer argued misconduct by the prosecution. That crosses the line between what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. And Linda Doloff's lawyer, Vern Parody, told the Supreme Court the prosecution crossed the line too many times, accusing the district attorney of misrepresenting facts and often attempting to sway the jury with her own personal opinions. And the trial judge consistently and on numerous occasions had to reprimand the prosecutor. The nearly three week long trial in 2010 was based on much circumstantial evidence. Doloff claiming an intruder had beaten her husband then shot her in the stomach. Point, Ms. Anderson. Assistant DA Ann Berlin telling the justices today the prosecution played by the book. It's about highlighting the strength of the state's evidence and pointing out that the defense theory of evidence does not take into account the state's evidence that was so strong. I've done a lot of appeals and it's, it's always difficult to get a gut feeling. Parody says he can't predict whether he'll win this appeal, but will say he's encouraged by the line of questions the court posed to both sides of the argument. I'm happy with the way the questioning went and I think that the, the justices um, they recognize the issues and the problems and I think that they at least have can make an informed decision. One of the biggest pieces of evidence that the grand jury was made aware of and the prosecutors knew about, but didn't really make it into the big narrative in the trial, was that um, Mr. Doloff had a job where he basically would um, be involved in downsizing companies where people would lose their jobs, people's lives would be affected. Um, and he was making tons of money off the misery of other people. And he said to the grand jury when asked, or to, when the prosecutor asked, he said, um, do you have any enemies? And he said, I have thousands of enemies. There are a lot of people that would want to hurt me. Um, again, another piece of evidence that who knows where to go with it, but it casts tons of reasonable doubt. So the prosecutor is lying through her teeth to the jury. She's hiding evidence from the jury that would lead you to see reasonable doubt. Um, you have the mysterious shadow in the window. You have no gunshot residue on her hand, on her shirt. You have somebody else's DNA on the gun. Her DNA is not on the gun or the bat. And you have a bloody mess of a crime scene, but yet she remarkably doesn't have much blood on her, and what little blood she does have on her can easily be explained away by that she just was, you know, she was in the house, she was in the crime scene when it happened, and maybe um, the husband, as she was comforting him, coughed up blood on her or something like that. 
her, the blood on her shirt was not consistent with the prosecutor's theory of the case. So you have all this reasonable doubt. The case reeks to high heavens of reasonable doubt. But yet the prosecutor creates a narrative not about trying to get justice, but about trying to win the case. And she leaves out crucial evidence that could help justice be served. See, this brings me back around full circle to where I started this video. That one thing about our justice system is that it's set up so that we're supposed to not be putting innocent people in prison. And one of the reasons that we don't put innocent people in prison is when the prosecutor sees that a case is full of reasonable doubt, they do not prosecute it. It's okay for some guilty people to go free in order for no innocent people to ever be convicted. But when you have prosecutors like this lady who made it her mission in life to get Linda behind bars, despite all the reasonable doubt in this case, then the justice system fails. And then we end up where we are today, where people are pissed off at police and prosecutors and government. She sounded very confused and frustrated and left out, pushed away. 2020 spoke to five of the 12 jurors after the trial. They brought us inside the jury box and behind closed doors during deliberations, talking about their doubts that Linda did it. The shadow in the window, and I just kept thinking back, what if someone was in the house? What if there's someone else? I don't want to play too much of the 2020 documentary because um, I don't want uh, my video to be flagged with YouTube's algorithms or anything. But, um, I mean, check out the 2020 video about this story. It's fascinating. Um, it goes into a lot more detail than even this video goes into, but um, I wanted to focus on the prosecutorial misconduct by the district attorney for the Cumberland County because there was no reason for them to bring this case to a jury. There was way too much reasonable doubt. If we truly care about justice and the justice system, especially about not convicting innocent people, when a case has this much reasonable doubt in it, it is the duty of the prosecutor to not bring it. I strongly believe there was prosecutorial misconduct here. So the Supreme Court decision actually sided with the prosecutor, and let me get into that right now. So the Maine Supreme Court upholds Standish Woman's bat attack conviction. Um, Maine's highest court on Tuesday uh, this is in back in 2012, upheld the conviction of Maine yoga instructor who was serving a 16-year sentence for beating her estranged husband with a softball bat for the st and for staging the attack to look like a home invasion. In a unanimous decision, the Maine Supreme Court rejected Linda Doloff's claim that the prosecutor misrepresented facts and expressed personal opinion and the judge erred in allowing certain statements and evidence during her 2010 trial. The 51-year-old Doloff was convicted of attempted murder, elevated aggravated assault, and other charges in the 2009 attack on her husband, Jeffrey Doloff, as he slept at their Standish home. The prosecutors, uh, the prosecution says she then shot herself to make it look like she was a victim of the attack. The couple at the time had agreed to a divorce and slept in separate bedrooms, but in the same house. In the opinion written by Chief Justice Lee, um, Lee Softley, the court found no evidence, evidentiary, evidentiary errors on the part of the judge and ruled that any improper statements or phrases made by the prosecutor did not result in an unfair trial. In her appeal, Doloff argued that the prosecution acted improperly by making a statement about the weight of the softball bat, commenting about a whimpering dog heard on a 911 call, making statements during her closing arguments, um, prefaced with the words, I think, making comments um, concerning the credibility of Linda Doloff and her attorney and urging the jury to do justice. Having reviewed all of Linda's many challenges, we are not persuaded that any prosecutorial misconduct, even considered cumulatively, affected the jury's verdict, the opinion said. 
During Doloff's 15-day trial, prosecutors alleged she attacked her husband in the early morning hours of April 12, 2009, so she could keep the couple's property and maintain the lifestyle she had grown accustomed to. Jeffrey Doloff sustained life-threatening injuries, including multiple skull fractures and a fractured nose, while having several teeth knocked out, according to court documents. He has no memory of the assault and is not expected to fully recover from his injuries. Linda's injuries were not life-threatening. The two were married in 1998. I'm not really surprised that the uh, Supreme Court upheld the um, conviction because it was a jury conviction, and it takes it takes a mountain of evidence to overturn a jury conviction. Um, usually, Supreme Court justices just will not go against a jury. Um, and what they didn't, they didn't conclude that the prosecutor didn't do anything wrong. They just concluded that the prosecutor did not sway the jury, which basically means that um, she had a competent defense attorney who gave a compelling argument on the other side. But still, there's just something fishy about this case because like I've said throughout this video, this case reeks of reasonable doubt. And one thing that I think is seriously messed up about our justice system is that sometimes just the fact that a prosecutor is going after you makes certain people in a jury pool think that you're guilty. Like they don't even care about the evidence. Just the fact that, you know, you've been charged with something because they trust the police and the government and prosecutors so much that it doesn't matter there's reasonable doubt. Anyway, there's... <sighs> A final thought I want to make before I kind of close out this is that a case where somebody is convicted 100% on circumstantial evidence is not a good case. And I feel personally that when we finally get around to doing criminal justice reform, like real criminal justice reform in this country, we need to revisit circumstantial evidence convictions because when you're convicted only on circumstantial evidence, especially end up getting something like the death penalty, which I'm very much against on only circumstantial evidence, um, then justice is not served. Because what that means is that innocent people will go to prison, innocent people will be executed, and our justice system will have failed its original intent that the guilty will be convicted, but the innocent will go free. A perfect justice system is where innocent people never get caught up in the system. But when you're convicted on circumstantial evidence, when prosecutors make their entire case based on circumstantial evidence, and then not only is their entire case based on circumstantial evidence, but there's tons of holes and reasonable doubt in the case, and then the person is still convicted, there's, that's not right. That is, there's something wrong. And I would dare say that in this case, the prosecutor misused her power because she moved forward with the prosecution knowing that it was a circumstantial only case and knowing that it was filled with reasonable doubt everywhere. Am I surprised this happened in Cumberland County, Maine? Not at all, because government officials in the state of Maine have zero accountability, zero. Imagine you're a public defender with a client accused of a serious felony. Your conversation almost always begins in jail. In the visitation room, you begin preparing him for the most important decision he has ever made. And he'll have to make that decision while sitting in a cage. The prosecution has offered a plea bargain. It expires soon. If he accepts a guilty plea, he'll get out of jail sooner than if he goes to trial. Before the plea offer expires, your investigator tries to identify and interview the prosecution's witnesses. Are they unreliable? Making faulty assumptions? Lying? It all matters to your client's freedom but you're operating in the dark because you don't know who those witnesses are. Why not just ask your client what happened? That might work if you were guilty, but innocent clients can't tell you what actually happened because for the most part, they don't know. You lay out the options for your client. He could go to trial, 
but a judge may detain him, which means waiting in jail for months, if not years, before a jury hears the case. The idealist in you hopes that your client will fight. You think he could win. But the realist in you recognizes that if he loses, he will go to prison, potentially for decades. The other option is he could accept the plea offer. It would mean going home sooner. It's no wonder that 95% of defendants accept plea offers. It's also no wonder that so many people exonerated of crimes like manslaughter and drug offenses originally pled guilty. Your client signs the paperwork admitting to something that you believe in your gut he did not do. The judge asks you, does either counsel know of any reason that I should not accept the defendant's guilty plea? You want to shout, yes, your honor. This plea is the product of an extortive system of devastating mandatory minimums and lopsided access to evidence. My client faced an impossible choice. He is saying what is necessary to avoid the possibility of losing his life to prison. Instead, you reply, no, your honor. Let me know your thoughts about this case in the comments. Keep the conversation going in the comments. Um, like the video, share the video, um, subscribe to my channel. I did finally go over 20,000 subscribers, so now I guess my goal is 25,000 or 30,000. Let's get up there. Um, and um, um, also consider buying something from my store. I don't make money doing these videos, so any support you could give me would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for watching. Prior to main denying my PI license, I really was invisible. I just kept to myself. I did my own thing. I worked hard, kept my nose to the ground, um, built up my business, and then boom, I run into a brick wall of corruption up in Maine. If I hadn't have run into that brick wall of corruption, I would not be posting these videos right now. I would not be exposing corruption all throughout main government pervasive corruption from that infects every aspect of the public sector in the main state government from the state police to local sheriff's departments to um, industries where cronyism just runs rampant in fact the corruption in Maine is so blatant and in your face it just surprises me you know, my life seemed more peaceful and more tranquil prior to knowing that my home state, the state that I love, the state that I want to move back to, the state that I wanted to move my family to and raise my kids in, is just so corrupt. And I'm speaking to the public officials right now, the public officials, the corrupt and dirty public officials in Maine. All you had to do was give me the PI license and I would have just shut up. I wouldn't have said anything. I would have just moved on with my life. I didn't want this fight. I mean, we have to be the change we want to see in the world. And when you see corruption as bad and as blatant as I see in Maine, what choice do I have? I don't want this for myself, but what choice do I have? give a shout out to the main fusion center, a secret main state police department set up in the wake of 9-11 to spy on terrorists, but now spy on anybody who's a little critical of the state of Maine. They have spied on me, they've spied on um, peaceful protesters, um, they've spied on people that were against a power line going through Maine, they've spied on uh, Black Lives Matter protesters. And they are my most loyal fan. They've watched all my videos, read all my posts. So a big shout out to the Main State Police Fusion Center. These videos do take a lot of time. I don't make money on them. So if you would not mind, go check out my website, um, nationalsi.com. And um, if you know anybody who does insurance fraud assignments, um, insurance adjusters, lawyers, um, please 
email me their contact information so that I can reach out to them. Um, I'm in the New England area. I'm licensed um, in uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont. I work in Rhode Island, and also I'm, I'm down in the south, too, in Tennessee. Um, uh, so any of those areas are are great. If you know people that are in the industry, please forward their information. It would be very, very helpful. Um, also, check out my store. Um, you can buy cool t-shirts and uh, mugs and different things that help support my work. I just want to get to the truth. That's my goal with every case, with every um, story that I do. And um, the truth and uncovering the truth is very important, no matter where it leads. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare place for you. And if I go and prepare place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also.